Hello and welcome to this special edition of 7.30 coming from New York. American politics is always colourful and full of intrigue, but rarely has the country seen an administration as tumultuous as the one run by the current US President Donald Trump. One of the most jaw-dropping moments of his presidency, and there have been a few, was the sacking of the FBI Director James Comey in May last year. Comey has been a thorn in Trump's side ever since, including with the high-profile publication of his memoir this week. It's called A Higher Loyalty. I sat down with James Comey in New York earlier today, but first here's a reminder of why he's one of the most divisive and influential FBI directors in American history. A very strong and powerful order. In the middle of one of the most incredible presidential election campaigns in history was this man, FBI Director James Comey. The FBI was running two investigations at the time, one very public probe into Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server while Secretary of State. I do take responsibility for having made what is clearly not the best decision. And another secret inquiry into possible collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. I never met Putin, I don't know who Putin is. He said one nice thing about me. He said I'm a genius. The FBI had concluded there was no criminality in Clinton's email use. And no charges are appropriate in this case. But then just days before the election, James Comey announced the FBI was reopening the case. Bang, out of nowhere comes this uh, inexplicable letter even today in my thinking. I, Donald John Trump, Behind the scenes, the FBI was still investigating the possible links between Russia and the Trump campaign. When Trump first became president, he seemed to be drawing Comey close. But things rapidly turned sour, and in May last year, Comey learned Trump had sacked him by seeing it on television. He's a showboat, he's a grandstander. But James Comey has refused to go quietly, first testifying before Congress, and now releasing an explosive memoir. James Comey, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, it's great to be with you. I want you to start by taking us back to January 2017 and your first meeting with the president-elect. What was the key item on the agenda and what was it like to come face to face with Donald Trump? I was there at Trump Tower January the 6th of 2017, so when President Trump was president-elect Trump at President Obama's direction with the leaders of the CIA, the NSA and the Director of National Intelligence to brief the president-elect and his new team on what the intelligence community, U.S. intelligence community's conclusion was about Russian interference in the election and to tell him that they, they had an extensive campaign to damage the American democracy, to hurt Hillary Clinton and to help Donald Trump. And so we laid that out to his team. And as I recount in the book, the reaction he had and of his team was largely focused on, can we say it had no effect on the election? You agree it had no effect on the election. And that was an analysis the U.S. intelligence community hadn't done and it wasn't qualified to do. At the end of that meeting, you spoke alone with President Trump so you could brief him on the so-called Steele dossier. It was research conducted by a private firm into Trump's ties to Russia, which included some very sensitive information about Russia seeing him as a potential target because of his alleged sexual behaviour in Moscow. How did Donald Trump react when you raised this matter? I was assigned to brief him privately afterwards. It made sense for me to do it alone, although in hindsight it would have been nice to find somebody else. But it was information that the FBI had from a reliable, credible source that potentially could be used to exert influence over the new president. I didn't know whether it was true, I didn't really care, but we wanted him to know this was out there for two reasons. First. We didn't want to be keeping secrets from the incoming president, especially about something that we thought the media was about to reveal. And we wanted to do a, what we call a defensive briefing, which is let the person know whether this is true or not, it's out there. And often that will diffuse the ability of an adversary to use that information. And his reaction was strongly defensive, which is reasonable. And, um, and then the conversation started to go off in some uh, awkward directions because I think it was he had a strongly defensive reaction and I was able to get it back to a place where I made clear to him that this isn't something that I care about just wanted him to know about it and the conversation ended shortly after that. You write that it did cross your mind that Trump may have thought that you were doing a J. Edgar Hoover on him in other words signaling to him that 
the embarrassing Russia dossier would perhaps give you some leverage and power over him. Is that what you were doing? Definitely not. But I worried because I, being a human, I know how humans are. We tend to assume people are seeing the world the way we do. And my worry was given his background as a deal maker and that sort of thing, he might assume I'm trying to gain leverage over him. It's the reason I was keen as I saw the conversation spinning off in a bad direction to say something to him that was true, that we were not investigating him personally. And that, I, I hope, went some way to blunt an assumption that I was up to no good. Later that same month, President Trump invited you to come and have dinner with him, just the two of you at the White House. What did he want from you at that meeting in your mind? He wanted me to, in essence, reapply for my job and pledge personal loyalty to him. Did he ask for it that directly? Yes. Near the beginning of the meal, he asked for it that directly, exactly that directly, saying, I need loyalty, I expect loyalty, or maybe it was the reverse, but he was asking for loyalty. And what did you say when he asked for that? I said nothing. I just stared at him. I was closer to him than you and I are here. The table was a small table. And I just stared at him while a little voice was inside my head saying, don't move, don't say anything, don't move. And I know that sounds weird, but in the moment that was all I could think of to do because I was so shocked by the fact that a president of the United States would ask the FBI director for loyalty. He then, at the end of the conversation, raised it again. What did you do on the second occasion? Second occasion came towards the end, as you said, and in between I had tried to interject and interrupt to, to teach a little bit, although that sounds condescending, but to, to share with him my view that it's important for the FBI to be at a distance from the political leadership for all kinds of reasons, and that's the tradition we've built since Watergate. And, and I explained to him how I think about my role, so that when he returned to it and asked for loyalty again, I responded, you'll always get honesty from me. And that connected to things I had said earlier. And then he paused and he said, that's what I want, honest loyalty. And I paused, really desperate to find a way to get out of this conversation. I said, you'll get that from me. And I think he understood what I meant by that, given the conversation that had happened since uh, we were staring at each other at the beginning. President Trump, on a, a further occasion, asked to speak to you alone as well, and this time he raised an investigation into an allegedly improper meeting between his national security advisor, Michael Flynn, and Russia's ambassador to Washington. President Trump said that he hoped you would be able to let it go. What did you take, take it that he meant by that? I understood him to be asking me to drop the FBI's criminal investigation of Michael Flynn. To play devil's advocate, when you look at, say, the Flynn meeting or the loyalty um, meeting, this is a guy who had no experience as a politician, as a diplomat. Is it possible he just didn't know what the norms of Washington were, that it wasn't something sinister? He just didn't know what the rules were. It's possible, I suppose, with respect to the loyalty piece possible. Although you're becoming president of the United States, you would expect the person to find out uh, what the norms would be. And I actually helped him understand those norms after the first request for loyalty and before the second. So I don't, I don't think it's fair to say that he didn't know then. And with respect to the conversation where he asked me to drop the investigation, if he didn't know it was something he shouldn't be doing, why did he kick everybody else out of the room, including the Attorney General of the United States, my boss? And so, look, I understand why people would ask that, but I, I, I don't think that's the better of the, uh, the perspective on it. How did you learn that Donald Trump was firing you? From TV screens. I was in Los Angeles, and I, as I explained in the book, I was there to go to a diversity recruiting event trying to attract more women and more people of color to the FBI, events that were really successful in other cities. And I got to LA early and visited the field office. And I walked, as I always did, and visited people at their cubicles and their desks and just thanked them each for their work. And I'm in the middle of saying that and explaining the FBI's mission. I look up and it says in big letters on at least one or two of the screens, it says, Comey resigns. And um, there are a lot of hilarious people in the FBI, including close to the director. So I thought it must be a prank. So I turned to my staff and I said, that took a lot of work. And then I went back talking. And then it changed and said, Comey fired. 
And so I knew that was not a joke. My team is funny, but they don't try to be that funny. And I said to the dis now distracted employees who could see from my face something was going on, I said, look, I don't know whether that's true or not, but whether it's true or not doesn't change what I need to say to you. And then I explained to them how important it was that they continue to pursue the mission of the FBI. And then I went to try and find out what was going on. Supporters of Donald Trump are angry at you. They think that you have a vendetta, that you're after Donald Trump and so forth. I mean, that must have been shocking to discover that you were sacked like that. Is there any um, merit to the point of view that that set you on a personal path of revenge against Donald Trump? I get why they would say that. I don't feel that. I don't feel anger towards Donald Trump. I'm deeply concerned about his leadership. I'm deeply concerned about his attacks on the rule of law in this country and on the FBI and the Justice Department. But my reaction actually in the moment was kind of confusion, a slight feeling of sick to my stomach, and deep sadness. And in part that was my initial reaction because that was the reaction of the employees. When I stepped out of the office after confirming it was true, lots of employees had gathered in that big space and they were standing there and many of them were crying. And so that, and then I started to get emotional and I remember it as a moment of just deep sadness. After you were sacked, you gave a friend a copy of the memo that you made about the Flynn meeting and he shared it with a journalist. You've been at pains to say in your memoir that you believe in independence and integrity. Didn't sending that memo to land in the media turn you into a political player? I hope not. I didn't think of it that way. I get why people would criticize it and ask about it, but I, I don't think of it that way. I thought, I need to do something and the president tweeted one morning, James Comey better hope there aren't tapes before he starts leaking to the media. And I, and I hadn't leaked anything to the media. I woke up a few days later in the middle of the night, I don't know, it took me a long time for this to dawn on me, realizing if there are tapes, he will be heard on that tape asking me to drop a criminal investigation. There may be corroboration. There may be backup for my account. Somebody has to go get the tapes. And I know the FBI will see it but I honestly didn't trust the leadership of the Department of Justice then to go get the tapes, and so I thought, I gotta do something to force them to go get them, and this is something I can do now that I'm a private citizen. And so I asked my friend, who also was being my lawyer, to get that information out to the media. Let me take you back to something that we touched on earlier, <coughs> which was Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential ele election and the Trump campaign's alleged links to Russia. In July 2016, the FBI opened an investigation into it. What triggered that? Information that came to the U.S. intelligence community and the FBI that a Trump campaign foreign policy advisor... George Papadopoulos? Right, had months earlier, so before any of it was public, that there were derogatory emails being released. Months before that, the, that George Papadopoulos was having conversations with a Russian contact about dirt they had on Hillary Clinton. And so that raised the prospect for the first time that this campaign that we were highly confident was going on to influence the election raised the question of whether any Americans were assisting it or conspiring in it. And George Papadopoulos shared that with Australia's High Commissioner in London, Alexander Downer, is that correct? And it came to you via Australian channels? Yeah, I, I can't say that. Is there anything further that you can tell us about, th about that meeting between Alexander Downer and George Papadopoulos? Uh, I'm not conceding that it was with Alexander Downer. At around the same time that you received that intelligence, Christopher Steele, a former British MI6 agent who compiled the Steele dossier, passed his information onto the FBI. His report alleged that the Trump campaign had accepted a regular flow of intelligence from the Kremlin and that Russian officials had been cultivating Trump as an asset for about five years, including gathering the material about his sexual habits that we discussed earlier. It also painted a picture of broader and aggressive Russian interference in the election. Why did the FBI keep the American people in the dark that it was investigating something so significant? Because we were acting consistent with our approach to investigations of all kinds, especially counterintelligence investigations. The, the investigations we began in late July focused on a very small number of Americans, not Donald Trump, trying to understand is there a connection between these Americans and the Russian effort. And so it was a counterintelligence investigation that we didn't know what we had, and we certainly wouldn't want to tip 
off the subjects of it that we were looking at it. And so there was no serious consideration given. Like, I don't even remember a single conversation about whether we should reveal the counterintelligence investigations because it would be utterly inconsistent with our approach. But there was a lot of discussion about whether we should say something to the American people about the broader Russian influence effort. Well, this kind of activity, you know, if proven, could rise to the standard of one of the biggest electoral crimes in American history. As I said, the Steele dossier was very detailed. You had the Papadopoulos information as well. Why did this not reach the bar um, where, as you say, there was even a discussion about sharing it with the American people? Because we didn't know what we had. So the question I'd ask people is, so what would we say? We'd tell the American people, we can't tell you who they are, but there's a, there's a few people that we think may have some connection to this. I just don't think that would be appropriate. We, we talk a lot in this country about the Hillary Clinton email investigation, which we did talk about publicly, but that began in public. And the Secretary of, former Secretary of State was the subject of that investigation. Very different posture than an early stage counterintelligence investigation. I'll come to the Clinton emails yeah. in more detail in a second, but you do write in your book that there are two exceptions to the no comment policy on investigations for in investigations of extraordinary public interest or where our investigative activity is apparent to the public. Surely the Russia investigation met both of those standards, even if it was in its early stages. We're talking about someone who's running for president of the, of the United States here being the subject of these very serious allegations. Yeah, but that's it. He wasn't the subject of the investigation. His campaign was, though. Well, people associated with his campaign in a very early stage counterintelligence investigation, I actually think it would have been irresponsible to talk about it then. Again, we didn't know whether we had anything and had just started these investigations. So it would have been an extraordinary departure to talk about them. We did talk about them in a general way the following spring when they were much farther along, but it just, it, it wouldn't make any sense for us to be talking publicly about an early stage counterintelligence investigation. Now, if the president was the subject of it, maybe you could make an argument differently, but I, I just don't see it with the, the people we were looking at. Around the same time that the Russia investigation has kicked off in July 2016, you held a press conference about the results of an investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. How is it not a double standard that you aired a great deal of information about the investigation into her and not into the Russian one? Yep, that's a reasonable question. And I think our treatment of the two actually illustrates the, the norm, the standard we try to apply. The Clinton investigation was public by that point, and we were closing it. And the, the secretary had been the subject of it. The counterintelligence investigations were just starting. In fact, they started three weeks later and were at an incredibly early stage involving not the candidate, but people who may be work, trying to figure out whether people were working with the Russians around the candidate. So we're closing an investigation that the public knows we've conducted. It's an investigation of one of the two candidates. And my judgment, and people can disagree about this, is that for the result to be credible, for the Obama administration to be closing an investigation of the Democratic candidate for President of the United States, we needed to offer the American people transparency so they could have confidence that it was done in a competent, honest, and independent way. And without transparency, there would be corrosive doubt about whether it was a political fix. And although I'm sure your mother taught you what my mother taught me, which is you can't care what other people think about you, when you run an organization like the FBI and the Justice Department, you have to care that the public has confidence in your work. And so my judgment was we need to show the American people as much as we can under the law and under our policy to reassure them this was done in a competent way, honest way, so they can move on. If you were concerned um, at the FBI being seen to be apolitical, why then in that press conference did you describe her behaviour as extremely careless? You, sh you could have simply said there's no criminal um, behaviour here and left it at that. Yeah, it's a great question. And the reason is because I thought the result will not be credible without that transparency. It was obvious that her behavior was careless, given that there was classified information on an unclassified system. And I thought, if I'm not honest with the American people about what we found and explain to them why we don't think it justifies a recommendation of charges, we will have undercut the credibility of the announcement. And so it seemed like an important thing to do, again, to facilitate public confidence in the result that this was done well. Here's what we found. Here's what we think about that. There's no there there. All of us can move on from this. 
Something that has also caused incredible controversy was that two weeks before the election you announced that you were reopening that investigation because a new trove of emails had been found on the computer of the husband of one of Hillary Clinton's staffers. You write in your book, assuming, as nearly everyone did, that Hillary Clinton would be elected President of the US in less than two weeks, what would happen to the FBI, the Justice Department or her own presidency if later it was revealed after the fact that she was still the subject of an FBI investigation? What if after the election we actually found information that demonstrated prosecutable criminal activity? Despite saying that throughout this period you were concerned with having the FBI seem apolitical, surely that is a clear political calculation that you've made there. I don't see it that way. I, I see it as a consideration of what damage will flow to the institutions from possible futures. That, that is a political consideration though, isn't it, don't you? Well, I, maybe, this, maybe it's a distinction without a difference, but I think public trust and politics are two different things. I don't remember thinking about politics or making a decision based on polls. In fact, I remember explicitly pushing away the notion that we should consider which candidate will be affected and in which way. but. Public trust in the institutions of justice matters. And my concern was, so which of these two terrible options do I choose? Do I speak about this or do I conceal this? Having told the American people repeatedly, we're done here, you can rely on that, now we're restarting it. And as you say, not in some teeny way, we're restarting this in a hugely significant way. So which do I do? Which will do the least damage to the institutions of justice? I mean, that's the standard. I hated the situation we were in. I wish I could have found a door that said, here's the good option, but the public trust dictated that we have to do the bad thing, not the catastrophic thing. I understand your point about the stage that the Russia investigation was in and the stage that the Clinton investigation was in, but you considered what would happen to the legitimacy of Hillary Clinton's presidency if your investigation was discovered after the election. But because you kept the Trump-Russia investigation a secret, isn't this the exact position in which the US now finds itself, which is a president who may have engaged in prosecutable criminal activity and that the FBI concealed it from the public before the election? Yeah, I don't see it that way because I think it would have been highly irresponsible in the summer of 2016 to say to the American people, we have these classified investigations going on. We don't know what we have. It doesn't involve Donald Trump directly, but there's some dirt we're looking into on the campaign. I, I can't imagine any FBI director or attorney general making a decision to make an announcement like that. Very different than a circumstance where you have a public investigation that you are closing and making an announcement on, and a very different circumstance when that investigation rears its head in, on Anthony Weiner's laptop before the election. So I see the two as very, very different. There may be some Americans and indeed people around the world who would see 36 classified emails on a private email server as a way less serious matter than potential Russian interference in an election possibly involving the campaign of one of the candidates. Sure, if you had reached a stage in the Russia interference election where you had hard findings of fact about the role of Americans in conspiring with the Russians. We had none of that. And I don't know where that stands, because there still hasn't been any public announcement by the special prosecutor as to who he's investigating and what he's found. And it's now another year later. In terms of the way the Clinton investigation was handled and then the way the Russia investigation was handled, would you make a different call on either of those matters with the benefit of hindsight? In small, not on the Russia investigation, in small ways on the Clinton investigation, but on the big decisions in the Clinton investigation where it was always no win, I think we chose the least bad alternative in each case. If I had a magic wand, Hillary Clinton would never have had a private email server and Anthony Weiner would never have had a laptop, because I hope I've made clear I didn't want to be involved at all. But once you're involved and you're stuck, you always have to choose the least bad door and that's painful and you know you're going to get hammered for it, but you are where you are. By your decisions in 2016, what part have you personally played in delivering the world a president that you yourself describe as morally unfit for the role? I don't know. I hope and pray none. It would be wonderful if someday someone makes the case that we had no impact on the election. The notion that we had an impact on the election makes me sick to my stomach. And that's not a commentary on Donald Trump, although I meant the things I've said about Donald Trump. That's a commentary on the fact that what I loved about the Justice Department and the FBI is we're not involved in politics. 
And the notion that because of the choices we had to make, we had an impact, leaves me feeling ill. Now, it may sound odd to say, but that wouldn't change the way I thought about the decisions. It just makes it more painful. You still got to do the right thing and choose, as again, as I thought about it, as between bad and catastrophic, you got to choose bad every day over catastrophic. A lot of Democrats are angry at you because they think that you cost Hillary Clinton the election. A lot of Republicans are angry at you because of what's going on with Donald Trump. Both sides seem to think you're partisan. So let me ask, did you vote in the 2016 presidential election? And if so, did. who did you vote for? I did not vote. Do you believe from what you've seen that President Trump is guilty of any criminal behaviour, either by colluding with Russia or by obstruction of justice in trying to prevent investigations into his campaign's alleged ties to Russia? I don't know, and it's not up to me. I'm a witness, maybe a witness, I suppose, in those examinations, and I don't know the answer because it would turn upon facts that I haven't gathered and, and can't see from where I sit. Have you um, been questioned by the Mueller inquiry already? Not, I can't comment on that. Um, FBI agents have raided the offices of Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, in recent days. How do you read the significance of that? I don't know enough to give you an intelligent comment. Uh, what, I, what I can say is what I think the American media understands, and I, and I hope our Australian colleagues understand, is that the search of a lawyer's office is something that is reviewed very, very carefully in the FBI and the Justice Department. It can't be done casually. And so well, I don't. Why I, is that? Because of the sensitivities around lawyers and the and the important privilege, confidential privilege that lawyers enjoy with their clients, and so you want to make sure that it's not done casually, that it's done very carefully, and then the material that you seize is reviewed in such a way that you're trying to protect attorney-client privilege. So I don't know the facts of that particular situation, but that's the the, the general approach. The Australian legal system is different to yours. What exactly is at stake in the Mueller inquiry? Could it result in the um, downfall of the Trump administration? I don't know. It, I don't. There's an interesting legal question as to whether, if the special prosecutor develops evidence sufficient to charge the president with a crime, whether the president of the United States under our legal system can be charged with a crime. I think the current view of the Justice Department and has been for some time that you can't criminally charge a president and so we in our constitution have a process for referring criminal misconduct to our congress for what we call, I don't know whether you have a term in Australia like this, impeachment proceedings. Is there a mechanism by which Donald Trump could orchestrate the sacking of Robert Mueller and what would happen if he did? I think there is a way the president can fire anybody in the executive branch can, it's a, can maybe a complicated way to accomplish it, but a president wanting to do it could accomplish it. I actually think the practical effect would be almost nil because knowing what I know about the Justice Department and the FBI, you'd actually have to fire everybody in those organizations to stop an investigation because somebody will pick it up and then if that person's fired, the next person will pick it up. And so until the buildings are vacant, it wouldn't stop. And so I, do, I think it would be bad for a lot of reasons to fire the special prosecutor here, be an attack on the rule of law, but it would actually be dumb because it wouldn't accomplish the goal of stopping the investigation. Given the uh, various people close to Donald Trump um, who've been drawn into the Mueller inquiry, given the raid now on Cohen's office, is it a reasonable assumption to make that Donald Trump himself would now be under investigation? I think so. and I. And again, I only know this from the media, but I, I think the White House itself put out that they, the president had been told that he was a subject of Robert Mueller's investigation, which means he's under investigation. I don't have any personal knowledge of that, but I've seen that said. Australia is one of the United States' closest allies, and Australian citizens are regularly told by their political leaders, and also when senior American officials come to visit, say, um, Senator John McCain came through, we're told that we should feel confident to rely on the alliance with the United States because uh, it's bigger than any one person, it's bigger than Donald Trump, and that there is a history and a, a structure and a, a scaffolding around it, if you like. In your judgment, can Australia continue to view the US as a reliable, trustworthy and credible partner while Donald Trump is president? Yes. And just because I know the, the extent and culture of the relationship between the two countries, 
I know it through the national security lens and law enforcement lens. It's, it'd be hard to screw up the relationship between the United States and Australia, and no one president has enough time to screw it up because it's so longstanding and so beneficial to both sides. We are at an historic moment with this presidency and, and possibly a turning point in the United States or even in global affairs. As FBI director, you were a significant figure during this period of time. How do you think history will remember you and is it how you would like history to remember you? You know, this is going to sound like a flip answer. I don't really care much uh, because that kind of thing, I know people pursue reputations and fame and whatnot. That's an empty pursuit. I hope I'll be remembered as a good father, a good husband, or maybe I'll get to be a good grandfather too, and a person who did some good for the people who needed it. The rest is, I'll be dead and gone. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. I know my children love me. Uh, I, I've read the audio book, so they're stuck with my voice. My grandchildren will hear my voice. I'm a happy person, and I hate that I was involved in a lot of this stuff. I'm not loving what I'm doing now because I don't love people yelling my name out on the street. Uh, it's hard for me to hide, but I, I'm at peace and uh, regret that I was involved. As I said, I, the FBI did not want to be involved in the 2016 election, but what are you going to do? Mr. Kim, you very much appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you for speaking to us. Thanks for taking the time.